Okay, now we're gonna look at a chapter dealing with chemistry. Well, wait a minute, isn't that what we've been dealing with? Well, yeah, but now we're gonna look at reactions. Really, to me, the heart of this introductory level chemistry class. Okay, so first we just need to define what a chemical change is and how do we know what's going on in a chemical reaction. Well, really chemical changes involve substances that are being reacted to form new substances. New substances that have therefore different compositions, properties, and therefore that's when you know a chemical reaction take, to, has taken place. For example, hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, two separate things. You could have a container of hydrogen gas and it has all of its properties, a container of oxygen gas, flammable, and all of its properties. But when they come together to synthesize and make a reaction, what would they make? They'd make water. Water has completely different properties. You break the bonds in the hydrogen and oxygen, you form bonds then between the two. So in a chemical reaction, then, old bonds are broken and new bonds are formed. Atoms in the reactants are rearranged to form one or more different substances. So a chemical equation. A chemical equation, we're going to look at lots of these guys. They give the formulas of reactants that are on the left-hand side of the arrow, right here, and products which are on the right-hand side of the arrow. Now, something to keep in mind, matter, law of conservation of matter, says matter can't be cre created, it has to be equal in terms of matter can't be created or destroyed. So if I have 10 grams of reactant, I have to have 10 grams of total product. And the same thing when we're counting as well. If I have one carbon on the left hand side, on the reactant side, I have to have one carbon on the right hand side. So if you look at this reaction here, down here at the bottom where I'm making carbon dioxide, um, there's a couple of things to talk about. So I see, you see the arrow right here. The arrow always divides the reactants which will be on the left-hand side, with the products on the right-hand side. Now, you can have one reactant, you can have multiple reactants. That isn't a set number. Obviously, you have to have a minimum of one, but what's important is if it sits to the left of the arrow, over on this side, these guys, again, reactants, whether there's one or ten, they're all the reactants, and what's on the right-hand side, again, whether it's one or whether it's ten, those are the products. Now, in terms of symbols, a uh, plus sign simply means you have carbon and or plus oxygen. So you use a plus sign when you have multiple reactants, or if I had other products, they would sit here with a plus between them as well. We talked about the arrow already. That leaves us with this little triangle. A triangle over the arrow means heat is needed, heat is required. There are lots and lots of reactions that will not happen unless you heat them up. And we're going to do some of those this semester as well in class, so you'll, you'll learn that. And then finally, let me erase all my scribble here. Finally, let me divide my table here. These little abbreviations, which obviously, I think if you look, make a lot of sense. S for solid, L for liquid, G for gas or vapor, and AQ, which means aqueous. Now, I don't have any aqueous substances in here, but if I did, aqueous means it's been dissolved in water. AQ is the abbreviation. And so, for instance, let me just show you one difference. NaCl, you should know is sodium chloride, as with the S abbreviation here, with an S, that means it's a solid, like salt, like what's sitting on your table in your kitchen probably. The AQ, think about what it means to be aqueous. This is salt water. Sodium chloride solids been dissolved in water, and that's what we call aqueous. So that just gives you an example of the difference between the two. Okay, one other thing to look at before we go on to the next slide, again, conservation of matter, really important. I can't have one carbon on the left and five on the right. Everything has to balance, and we're going to learn more about balancing here in a second, but let me show you how this equation right here is balanced. I have how many carbons on the left-hand side? Well, just one. How many carbons on the right-hand side? 
yeah, I know it's in the carbon dioxide molecule, but that's okay. We're just making an accounting and you look at them individually. So there's just one carbon on the right hand side of the arrow. All right, and then the other element we have to look at is oxygen, O2. Well, obviously there's two oxygens on the reactant side and two oxygens on the product. Now, before I go any further, let me just show you something. Whether you have an O2, the two being a subscript, or whether you have the two in front, it's still quantity two, and it still counts for when you're doing this accounting and you're going to work towards balancing. So either one of these means the same thing in terms of my counting. I have two oxygens. Okay, so that's, and that's what I was getting at here, balanced equation. There has to be the same number of each type of atom on both sides of the arrows. The numbers in front that we use help us balance the equation. Now, this is really important. We can only put numbers in front, or we assume it's one if there's nothing written there. We can only put coefficients in, um, in front of the substances. You cannot start changing these guys down here, these subscripts. Otherwise, you change what you have. So over here, again, let me give you an example. If I need Let's say I need three waters. I'm not just going to go in here and put change those subscripts. This is a chemical formula that shows me the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen in a molecule of water. This, not water, not water. So if I need three H2Os, I put the three in front, three H2Os. Okay, so I cannot emphasize that enough. You can never change what you have. You can never change the chemical formulas. You can only, only put coefficients in front to balance it. All right, so let's get back to what we're doing. So for instance, okay, imagine you only see this guy here to start with, okay? Al plus S makes Al2S3. Again, I always put lines underneath, even if there's barely any room. I can only put coefficients in front to balance. And then it kind of becomes like an algebra game. Remember, when you put a number in front, coefficient in front, everything in that formula gets multiplied by that number. And in aluminum and sulfur's case, on the reactant side, on the left-hand side here, that they're by themselves, so it's pretty easy. If you put a number in front of aluminum, it's only going to affect aluminum. Put a number in front of sulfur, it'll only affect sulfur. But if I had put a number here in front of the Al2S3, you'd have to remember that everything inside gets multiplied by that number. Okay? So let me just show you how this is balanced then, back to again my work here. So on the right hand side, I have two aluminums and three sulfurs to get me started. On the left hand side, I have one aluminum and one sulfur. So again, it's all about multiplication. 1 times what will give me the two aluminums I need? Well, I change that 1 to a 2. Two aluminums. And then the same thing for sulfur. I put a 3 in front. Now, I'll be honest. This is this one here, pretty easy. Okay, pretty easy because you just have aluminum by itself and sulfur by itself. But as you'll see later, they can get kind of complicated. Again, I cannot emphasize enough. Only coefficients can be changed. Only coefficients can be changed. Okay, so let's look at the following. And again, you kind of have to pretend you don't see what the answer is. P4, Br2, PBr3. So if we make an accounting, on the left-hand side to start, I have four phosphorus and I have two bromine. On the right-hand side, I have one phosphorus and I have three bromine to get me started. Now clearly, nothing's balanced. My phosphorus are off four and one, my bromine are off two and three. Now, again, it's all about multiplication, and I typically look for an easy fix to start with. So for instance, phosphorus, I have one on the right-hand side, I have four on the left. Well, one times four will equal four. So I find, oops, I find phosphorus and I put a four in front. 4 phosphorus, now this changes to a 4, and my phosphorus is balanced. But what did I just do to bromine? Remember, when you put a coefficient in front, everything gets multiplied by that coefficient. So now I have 4 times 3, now I have 12 bromine on the right-hand side. It's still not balanced, but it wasn't to begin with, so I don't really care. 
Phosphorus is good. And now, do you see really easily? 2 times 1 equals 12. 2 times 6. So I find the 2, or the 2-bromine, and I put a 6 in front. 6 times 2, now I have 12-bromine. And that's also balanced. Remember, you can only change the coefficients in front. You can only put numbers in front to play the game and make it all balanced. And so here's where my final balanced equation is. All right, how about this guy here? This one gets a little trickier. Again, imagine you can't see the final answer. So here's what I do. Draw my line. On the left-hand side to start, I have aluminum. I just have one of them. Iron, I have two. And oxygen, I have three to start. On the right-hand side, aluminum, I'm starting with two. Iron, I'm starting with one. And oxygen, I'm starting with three, okay? If you can't see that, pause this slide and take a better look at that. Make sure you understand where you're starting from and where all those numbers I just wrote down came from. Okay, now we're ready to balance. So it doesn't matter which one you start with. Obviously right now, oxygen's okay, three and three. But aluminum is off. I have one on the left, I have two on the right. So go to the smaller number. One times what will equal two? Well, one times two. So wherever aluminum is, I put a two in front. And that now balances aluminum, two and two. Iron, let's look at iron next. Iron has two on the left, one on the right. Go to the side with the smaller number. One times what is two? Well, again, like I just said, one times two is two. And on the right-hand side, wherever iron is, I put a two. Two iron on the left, two iron on the right. This is balanced. And, and the only reason I left oxygen alone is until last, oxygen can sometimes be a little pesky beast. And so this time it wasn't. This time I started with three. I didn't mess with anything in front of um, one of the compounds that had oxygen. So that's it. It stayed balanced at three. And that was it. That's my balanced equation. Okay, here's some more, just practice for you. And as I said, here's where oxygen can become difficult. Here's where oxygen can become difficult. And that is when you have oxygen in multiple places, okay? Especially on the, the burning of natural gas, this stuff's called methane. We'll learn about that when we do naming organic compounds later. Um, but the problem is when you start to balance this, you have two oxygen plus one. On the right-hand side, when you start, you have three oxygens, okay? So I'm going to do this one down here. I'm going to do my division. I have carbon, one, hydrogen, four, whoops, and oxygen, two, on the left-hand side to start. On the right-hand side, I have one carbon, I have two hydrogen, and I have three oxygen. Okay. So, <clears throat> where do you want to start? Carbon's good, as is. Hydrogen, I have four on the left, two on the right. So go to the side with the smaller number. Two times what will give me the four I need? Well, of course, two times two. So I find hydrogen, and in front of hydrogen, I put a two. But be careful, hydrogen wasn't by itself. Hydrogen was also with oxygen. So I've got to readjust my oxygen totals. I still have the two from here, but now I have two times one. Now I have a total of four oxygen on the right-hand side. If you can't see that, hit pause and look at it for a minute, and then come back and hit play when you're ready. Okay, so my oxygen total is four on the right-hand side. So let me check off my list. Carbon's balanced, hydrogen's balanced. That leaves me oxygen. Two on the left, four on the right. Come to the side with the smaller number. Two times what will equal four? Well, two times, oops, I was doing it up here. Two times two will equal four, and that will balance my oxygens. So as you can see here, this is that final balanced equation. Okay, here's what I want you to do at this point. I guess I know the answer is right there. I want you to pretend you can't see the answer, and I want you to take this equation. I want you to hit pause, go away from the computer screen, write this on a piece of paper, and see if you can practice balancing. I will tell you this one's a little tricky. This one's tricky, and you're going to find, again, that oxygen can be a real pain. So hit pause, and when you come back, we'll talk about it. Okay, so for this one, again, you can start wherever you want. I probably would have started with the carbon. I have four here and only one here, so I'd put a four. That balances my carbon, four and four. Then I'd move on to hydrogen. 
because again, I always leave oxygen for last. I have 10 hydrogen on the left. I'm starting with only two on the right. So two times five will equal 10. And so far, okay, not so bad. I have four carbons on both sides. I now have 10 hydrogens on both sides, but my oxygens are still off. I have two oxygen on the left. I have eight plus five, I have 13 on the right. So again, go to the side with the smaller number, two times what will equal 13? Well, here's the problem. It's not a whole number. And in case they didn't hear me say this, they can only be whole number coefficients. But not to worry, a, a temporary fix is to use a decimal number. So if you don't know what 13 divided by two is, I'm just gonna tell you, it's 6.5. So I wouldn't even write it as a fraction, I'd just write, whoops, 6.5. And temporarily, you can leave it like that. So at this point, right here, at this point, everything's balanced. However, I can't have a half of a molecule of something. Think about that. No, I need to finish this up by get, getting rid of the decimal. And your decimal's only ever gonna be 0.5, because you either have a whole number or a half number. So it's pretty simple. But anytime you do this, and you've got a decimal, or if you wanted to do it as a fraction, that's fine. The only thing you do then to fix it, it's a pretty easy fix, and this always works. Take your 0.5, or well, in fact, take everything, and multiply it by two. You can't just multiply the oxygen by two. No, because then that would be 26 and not, in, not as many oxygen on the right. It still has to balance. So you multiply everything by two. And then that leads you with your final equation. All right. Magnesium phosphate, which is Mg3PO42, it's insoluble, which means it doesn't dissolve, while sodium phosphate, Na3PO4, and magnesium chloride are water-soluble. So <clears throat> here's my equation. Okay, not balanced up here, I just circled, but fine. this is sodium phosphate. This is magnesium chloride. By themselves, they are soluble in water, and that's why the aqueous symbol is used, okay? Aqueous, soluble in water. Now, what's happening here? Everybody's switching partners. Sodium is a cation. Magnesium is a cation, has a different charge to it. And phosphate, PO4, this is one of those polyatomics, and chloride is Cl minus. So remember, when things are soluble in water, these ionic compounds, for instance, what that means is if I have a beaker of water, sodium phosphate's floating around. Well, in fact, it's a three to one ratio, but the ions are floating around. They're separated. That's what solubility means in terms of ionic compounds. And then the same thing here for my magnesium chloride. If I have a beaker of water or a container, whatever it is, the ions are separated. And then if I take a beaker and pour it all together, what happens? Well, I make a compound that is insoluble in water, which means it's not separated into its ions. This is what solid means, insoluble in water. Now, just because something says S, like my sodium chloride example a few slides ago, doesn't mean that that's not soluble in water. Sodium chloride sure is soluble in water. However, when you have a reaction that has some things that are aqueous, that means this stuff, this reaction is happening in an, a water, in a liquid, well, liquid water, but in an environment with water. So when I say solid in this type of reaction, we call this a precipitate. And it would look like, if you see in this little test tube right here, that white cloudiness, that white cloudiness, if you were to separate it, like with a you know, strainer or something, you could keep the white solid separate from the rest of it because it's insoluble. It's actually solid particles floating around. But then my other product, because everybody switched partners, sodium went to this negative anion and magnesium went to this whoops that was three minus two sorry not three plus three minus is the charge on phosphate everybody switched partners and the other product that's formed is sodium chloride which we know is soluble in water which means it will still be just floating around as an ion so this is a precipitation reaction where I take two aqueous substances and one of the products that results is an insoluble solid. We call that a precipitation.
type of reaction. All right, here's some additional types of reactions. We've got, a re we've got on the left reactions of some metals, metals like sodium, magnesium, potassium. Remember those guys that sit on the left-hand side of the periodic table with water. And then over here on the right-hand side, reactions of some elements with oxygen. And I'll let you read through these. The reason you'll see these separate steps is simply, again, working through balancing of them. That's it. Same reaction, just the top one is unbalanced, the first one, the second one is balanced. Okay, the same thing over here. Unbalanced, still unbalanced, but now balanced. Unbalanced, unbalanced, finally balanced. Okay, so if you need some practice balancing, take those first equations, write them on a piece of paper, see if you can balance them, and then come back and check your work. So here's something to, to, to note here. Note that when magnesium and iron magnesium and iron are reacted with oxygen, they actually lose electrons and become um, positively charged in the process. Anything that loses electrons is called oxidation. Now, how in the world would you know they lose electrons? Well, let me erase this scribble here and let's take a look. So, written by themselves, and I'm just going to do it for iron, all, iron all by itself right here has a charge of zero, unless otherwise noted. Same thing with oxygen right here. That's its elemental diatomic state, neutral. But when it's in an ionic compound like this, remember ionic compounds between metals and nonmetals? Well, I've got my metal that has some kind of positive charge to it. I have my nonmetal, oxygen, which has some kind of negative charge to it. The metals go from neutral to positive, which means they are losing or donating electrons. And my non-metal, oxygen, goes from neutral to some kind of minus charge. Minus two, usually. Um, and anyways, neutral to minus, well, electrons have a negative charge. So, my, my non-metal is gaining or gains electrons. Okay, that's what we're talking about here. The loss of electrons is oxidation. So, iron, in this example I just did, is oxidized. The oxygen then gained electrons, and that's called reduction. All elements, remember, in their elemental state are neutral, like I just showed you with iron and oxygen, and are assigned that oxidation state of zero. Same thing for sodium and potassium. When they're reacted with water, they become positively charged. In this case, the hydrogen in water, plus one, was reduced to its elemental state of H2 with a neutral charge. So what in the world does that mean? Well, let me show you over here on the left-hand side. Let me bring this over a little bit. Blow it up. Whoops. And let's look at charges over here on the left. So sodium all by itself, elemental state, zero charge. Sodium over here in this compound, sodium hydroxide, again, sodium is going to be a positive. Hydroxide, OH, is a polyatomic. It's going to be negative. So sodium goes from zero to plus, as metals do. They donate or lose electrons. Remember, that's, what is that? oxidation. And then if somebody is losing, somebody must be gaining. And so if we watch hydrogen throughout the course, hydrogen starts out in water as a plus one, and hydrogen over here ends up in its elemental state all by itself, which means it's neutral, going from a positive to zero. Positive things, remember, something with a positive charge or a cation is short one electron from being neutral. If you forgot how that works, remember, for instance, if I had 11 positive protons and 11 negative electrons, that would make something that's neutral. If it loses an electron, now I, let's say I only have 10, I still have my 11 positive protons. So in other words, you've got a positive 11 and a negative 10. Do the math on that, that's where your positive 1 comes into play. Again, it's counterintuitive of what you, you know, want to think that it would be. Something with a positive charge is actually short, short electrons compared to what it was when it was neutral. So hydrogen in water is a plus one. Hydrogen by itself is neutral. It's gaining electrons through the course of the reaction. And that is, my friends, called reduction. Reduction. Let me get this back to... Do, 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 do. Okay, so that's another type of reaction. It's called oxidation reduction reactions. Okay, now let's look at quantities. Quantities in terms of my 
molecules and atoms and things like that. Okay, so one ream of paper, in case you're unaware of this, one ream of paper actually has 500 sheets in it. A case of pop or soda or beer, typically 12 cans. Okay, sometimes 12, 24, excuse me, sometimes 12, depending on where you live. Um, I know where I'm at, it seems like we're getting more and more 12 packs, making up a case, but 24 or 12. And then what we all should know already, one do dozen of anything, whether it's eggs or donuts or cans of pop or whatever, it equals 12. Well, in counting in chemistry, we use this thing called the mole. And such as one, similar to how one dozen equals 12 of anything, one mole equals this big, huge number of anything. So this thing is called Avogadro's number, and it's 6.0, well, it's rounded up here, 6.03, sometimes you'll see 6.022, just depending on the textbook author, but that's Avogadro's number. Okay, Avogadro's number. Where in the world did this come from? Well, if you remember back when we talked about atomic theory, we had the, I had the mass of a proton, neutron, and electron written out. Okay, and this comes from that. It comes and in, interplays into that. But it works the same way as a dozen for counting. Yeah, I know it's just a lot bigger number and you've got to use your calculator to do calculations with it. But the same idea applies and I want you to always, always think of that. Okay. <clears throat> so, if we want to figure out the mass of one mole of carbon-12 atoms, well, we can f work this whole thing out, but guess what? One mole of carbon atoms, which, okay, let's take it back a step first. That'll be 6.02 or 6.03, depending on who you're talking to, times 10 to the 23rd, we'll all agree on that atoms of carbon okay for counting remember one mole equals that number of anything but if we're talking about mass all this fancy fancy math right here guess what one mole of carbon has a mass of 12 grams and that matches what's on the periodic table again I'm rounding close enough it's like 12.011 but close enough it's 12 grams for one mole. So in other words, all those masses on the atomic or on the periodic table, the units for practical purposes, things we can actually put on a balance scale and weigh, you use grams. But that's the mass of one mole. Um, just to give you an idea here, okay, again, reiterate, emphasize, hit home, one mole of anything is equal to, oh, I guess it's fixed here, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Guys, you should really use this. That's kind of a typo in the slide, I guess, from the publisher, but this is really Avogadro's number. I apologize. It's 0 0.03 in some places, but 6.02, 6.022 is really the number you should be using. Regardless, again, back to what I was talking about. All this stuff, whether they're atoms or molecules or formula units or whatever it is, one mole of anything, even if I was talking about donuts, one mole of donuts would be 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd donuts. Okay, so let's look at a couple problems down here. How many moles of oxygen are in one mole of aspirin? So one of these guys has how many oxygens in it? Four. It's a one to four ratio. One mole of this is going to have four moles of oxygen, and that just comes from the subscript four with the oxygen. If we want to know how many individual atoms, well, now we've got to apply Avogadro's number. If we know that there's four atoms of oxygen per every one molecule of aspirin, well... <clears throat> You use Avogadro's number and you're going to find out it's 24 times 10 to the 23rd or 2.4 times 10 to the 24th if you wanted to put the decimal in there, but that would change this to a 24, okay? It's a one mole equals that conversion. Okay, how about now let's convert mass in grams of a mole of something. Well, again, this is really simple. You use your periodic table, and you use the chemical formula, and add it all up. So in aspirin, there's 9 carbons. Each carbon weighs 12, so 9 times 12. 
Hydrogen, whoops, it's not blown up. Hydrogen has a mass of one, so one gram per mole times, there's eight hydrogen and aspirin. And then oxygen, four times 16 grams per mole. Again, this comes from the periodic table. But there's four oxygen in an aspirin, so four times 16, and you add it all up. An aspirin has a, we call it a molar mass, Molar mass is the mass of a mole, has a molar mass of 180 grams per mole. So one mole of aspirin has a mass of 180 grams. Okay? And that works for anything. Water, H2O, add it all up off the periodic table. It would be one mole has a mass of 18 grams for water. Okay? Here are some molar masses of some relatively common elements and compounds. Again, how do we come to these big numbers? We need the chemical formula and we need our periodic table and you simply add them up, add them up. Okay, back to again the law of conservation of mass. Yeah, I know this keeps coming up. Well, guess what, it's really important. Law of conservation of mass indicates that an in an ordinary chemical reaction, matter can't be created or destroyed. Again, the total mass has to be the same on the reactant and the product side. So for instance, if you can kind of see here and here, okay, this is my balanced equation from silver and sulfur making silver sulfide. If you start with, looks like that's 215.8, 215.8, .8 grams of silver and 32.1 grams of sulfur put it together and guess what the total mass is 247.9 grams law of conservation of mass at work here reactant one reactant two put them together the product the product 247.9 is the sum of those two now down here Let's look at this, what's going on down here. I've got two moles of silver, one mole of sulfur makes one mole of silver sulfide. That's the balanced equation. In terms of numbers, again, this comes from the periodic table, periodic table, and then this is the total from the periodic table. Okay, I just happen to pick and throw those same quantities on the balance, okay? But you can see where your totals come from. Okay, so let's look at a problem here. Consider this equation, four iron atoms reacting with three oxygen molecules, and this should really be an arrow, makes two iron three oxide molecules. So the question is, four atoms of iron react with three molecules of oxygen to make two molecules of the iron three oxide. You can read this equation in terms of moles by then putting a unit in front of the number, So or after the number. 4 moles of iron plus 3 moles of oxygen make or equal or produce 2 moles of iron 3 oxide. These ratios you can use now to work a problem out. Okay, finally we're going to look at energy changes in chemical reactions. As you know, a lot of reactions require energy. Some reactions give them off. Have you ever played with one of those hot or cold packs where you you kind of snap it and shake it and it gets cold or you snap it and shake it and it gets hot? Well, those are two different types of reactions. One is giving off heat energy, one is pulling it, pulling heat energy, and so one gives the hot temperature feeling, one gives the cold feeling. You've probably had that, right? All right, so first let's take a step back and talk about why chemical reactions occur. Consider the reaction of paper, which is mainly cell, oops, cellulose with oxygen. Does a reaction occur? What are the products and why doesn't paper just act spontaneously with oxygen? For instance, just in the air, you've got paper sitting around you right now, or is it reacting? Well, as you can see right here, the driving force for most chemical reactions is the conversion of potential energy to kinetic energy, meaning the release of heat, similar to water going over the dam. That was the picture on the last slide. So, reactants, if they start 
let's just say here in energy, and the products are lower in energy, and then imagine you are climbing a hill. You've got to climb the hill, so you've got to put energy in to get from the starting line to the top of the hill. We call that activation energy, the amount of energy it takes to go from your starting point to the top of that hill. But then when you come down the hill, all this energy is given off. So again, just think about climbing a hill. Put energy in to get to the top, but then to come down, energy would be released. And the difference between the energy that you start with, reactants, and the energy that you finish with products tells you whether it's this is going to be an endothermic or exothermic reaction. Can you take a guess as, at which one is overall releasing energy and which one is requiring? And how would this look if it was the opposite? Instead of energy being given off and, and products being lower in energy, what if they were higher? Well, it would look something like this. Okay. Here are your reactants, here's your products. Okay. This would be the opposite of this guy here because your products are higher in energy than the reactants. So you'd put all this energy in to climb to the top of the hill and you'd only get a little bit back coming back down the hill. So the overall net would be that this requires energy. All right, let me save the suspense. Exothermic, this guy here. Energy is given off. Products are lower in energy than reactants. Okay. And therefore, what do you think endothermic is? Well, of course, it's this guy here. Products are higher in energy than reactants. Okay. There's your ice pack there. So what's going on inside one of these ice packs, there's kind of like a, a container or a little baggie inside of a baggie. And when you pop it, you mix the two reactants. So there's no chemical reaction happening until you snap that inner bag and the two mix, okay? And so what happens is a reaction that actually absorbs heat and therefore you feel cold, it feels cold. Isn't that crazy to think? Yeah, well, that's what's happening. As it says, it's far less common what's going on in the, the ice packs here. <clears throat> so let's look at, oops, sorry guys. Let's look at these three reactions and notice where the energy sits. Sometimes I actually give units of energy. Kilocalories is a unit of energy. And sometimes I actually just list heat. So based on whether where the heat sits, reactants versus products, let's pick and say, which one's endo, which one's exo. So exo means energy is exiting the system. So when heat energy is given off, when it's a product, it's exothermic. And whether we actually know a quantity, like 22 kilocalories of heat energy, or whether I just say heat, either one, as long as you know heat energy of some sort is being produced or in the product side, remember these should be arrows, exothermic. If energy is a reactant, or if I had listed the word heat here, either case, an actual quantity with a unit of energy, or the word heat, if it's listed as a reactant, that would be endothermic. Okay? And that concludes the section on chemical reactions.